Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of managing people. This is a part of my management series. I have several I have things like uh, managing organizations and even office politics. This one, uh, as opposed to something like a managing organizations, is specific to you being a manager of, of people and we put emphasis on, on those subordinates, but we've we also talk about managing up and things like that, but it's more of the one-on-one uh, -on -one and we get into more organizational behavior as we move into the managing organizations. So with that in mind, let's jump into it. I got a pretty full board here. The first thing I wanna talk about is actually what you should avoid when getting advice on managing people. I always say watch out for one-sided advice because most things when it comes to managing people can cut both ways. There's competing schools of thought. So for example, uh, become very fashionable in the 90s to everybody wanted to talk about teams and teamwork and there's val valid uh, areas where teams have been very helpful, but there's also a lot of work that they found subsequent uh, tends to be best done when it is uh, either done by an individual or at least coordinated by an individual. Same thing, uh, right now we, we hear a lot about empowering the individual, but if you have uh, an organization where you have empowerment without any oversight or control, you can end up with people doing irresponsible things and you can also lack, even if it's not deliberately uh, the wrong thing to do, even if they're not being deliberately selfish, sometimes it's just unfocused. Um, and that, that's very closely related to um, areas where you have to balance being giving people discretion, letting them use their time accordingly, uh, versus being strict and, and holding them accountable. And also if you're a manager, oftentimes you're gonna be held accountable for their, their um, activities. And if they're, not, if they're deemed to be not in the common interest of the organization, you're gonna have to answer for that. So you can't let them have ultimate, uh, uh, limitless discretion or if something goes wrong and you say, well, I wasn't in charge of that, you know, it's considered your house, your responsibility to monitor uh, what's going on in your workforce. Uh, also, you have to make some decisions about how you manage failure. If you punish failure, uh, if you only reward the people who succeed, you will end up with a very risk-averse organization. But conversely, if you have no uh, si consequences to failure and if you don't reward success, then you will end up with an organization that's uh, ambivalent about results. Likewise, you want to ask yourself if you want to manage people for, you want to push them to do work quickly moving at the speed of business we all say nowadays but then you also have to bear in mind that there's a lot of uh, examples where people went off half cocked and they would have been better if they were slow and more methodical and more thoughtful and then the last example i'll give here for one-sided advice is uh you know a lot of managers want to say uh you know i come into the office and and uh push people and create a lot of activity trying to light a fire under everybody make sure that we're all um uh energized and working uh towards the right goals but that can also become intrusive because uh, one, one person once put it, sleep, uh, work is like, doing work is like sleeping. You have to sort of take time to get into the deep sleep and then come back out. And if you're always having a manager walking by your desk asking how things are going, or if uh, you know, they expect a response to every email that a manager sends out within you know, 15 minutes, and if it's been an hour and you haven't responded, you're not paying attention, well then you're being intrusive as a manager because those people don't have time to sort of get into that deep work. They, keep, they have to keep coming back and fighting fires and they never get into that deep state of uh, performance. And so there's a lot of, I find one-sided advice uh, people tend to sort of glamorize one versus the other, and I think there are several reasons for that. First of all, oftentimes you have experience that has led you to, you, you, you came into an organization that was one way, and uh, you tried something else, and that worked better, and so your experience, one or the other, uh, will tell you. And likewise, some of your peers, or perhaps even your current manager, tells you, you know, here's how you, here's how you manage, here's how you motivate people, because that's been their experience. But it's important to note that mo all of our experience is limited and it's a mistake to assume that what we've done applies to every situation, every organization, or every person. We'll get into flexibility here momentarily. The other thing is a lot of the people who, like myself, who give advice for a living want to sell as many books or get everybody to hire us to present and so we exaggerate the novelty and universality of our advice. So all of a sudden it became fashionable to talk about teamwork and everybody saying everything needs to be run with teams and but the reality is there are things that are better off not being run by teams but if you say that then your book is only of limited utility. So you tend to we tend to emphasize uh, one or the other. And uh, the last one is 
I'm a big believer in the idea that we tend to have a predisposition and we select whichever school of thought supports our predisposition. So in other words, if we're hyperactive, if we're high energy people, we tend to like the fast examples. And we will, so, and very genuinely, we can find examples that illustrate how speed was the most important uh, factor in success. But you can also find examples where uh, methodical, slow, thoughtful work was the most, was the key determinant to success. The thing is we tend to diminish the things that don't support how we already are. And that's putting the cart before the horse. We're not thinking about what the right scenario, what the right uh, behavior is for the situation. We have an intuition on how we want to act and we select the information that supports that and diminishes the information that questions that. And uh, I think I gave the fast, slow example. You could also say the, the lighting fire versus intrusive. You know, people who like to be bossy always want to think that, you know, lighting the fire is the important thing and they tend to discount the, uh, the, the possibility that they're being intrusive. Uh, conversely, very laid back managers, perhaps a new manager who wants to be different than all the other managers, might be really laid back, they don't intrude at all, but they're not really uh, energizing the organization or getting them focused. Um, another good example of this that I think we've seen particularly lately is uh, because the dot-com stories, the technology startups have been very, um, have, been, have been a lot of the success stories in business, uh, and especially the creation of personal wealth. That we, they, that we tend to sort of go to all of them and ask them how they do it. And they say, well, you know, we empower our individuals and we give everybody discretion and we encourage everyone to take risk. And they, I think, genuinely believe when they're giving this advice that that's correct because that's been their experience. Uh, and, and in their circumstance, it might be. But it's important to note most startups start off with, uh, you know, a handful of people and then grow to a couple of dozen people and then a few hundred people and then they sell out to uh, a major company. Whereas, you know, if you're General Motors and you have 200,000 people, giving them ultimate empowerment and discretion could create absolute chaos. So it's important to remember that different organizations and different circumstances might vary. And that segues ni nicely into my next, what I call the most important message uh, if I could say just one thing on managing people, it's you want to be flexible. As I said down here in cart before the horse, we tend to have a, uh, a, a nature, a predisposition, and we tend to act according to that. And then we end up finding places that that works best because that's where it's rewarded. But ultimately what would be best is if we could change which of these we were following based on the people that we were working with, the organization we were in, and the circumstance. And uh, like I said up here, situation, um, it's also important to remember, and, and people, it's also important to remember people are not interchangeable parts. And this is an important thing for people from uh, who being elevated to management positions from technical positions, oftentimes engineering, some of the hard sciences, because now, you know, we're used to try, experiment, and adjust accordingly. Uh, people aren't always going to react the same way that machinery or, or uh, technology does. Uh, computer code does and so that that that's a big you got to really broaden you, the way of, of thinking about it and and realize that some things that work in one situation might not work in another so let's move on a little bit and talk about selecting some of the people this can be selecting for either uh, br bringing them into the organization hiring decisions or promotion decisions um, specific to hiring one of the things that is uh, the classic uh, selection tool shall we say is the interview and I like to point out that one of the best things you can do is get beyond the interview and get into a conversation I had a job interview once where I was supposed you know it was an hour long and we spent a half hour doing all the usual you know tell me your strengths and weaknesses what do you think about this company why are you applying and then there was like a half hour left where I was supposed to ask questions of this person but I'd met several people that day and I said you know look they have really answered most of my technical questions and we just ended up having a conversation and I actually felt that, you know, at first I panicked. I'm like, we got a half hour left and I got, I'm on stage and I got time to kill. And it ended up being the best thing that we could do because it took us off script and you really learn what makes the person tick. And I think that's particularly important. I think nowadays everybody has read the same books and talked to the same uh, counselors about how to interview well. The only thing you learn in a job interview anymore is whether or not they know how to prepare, whether they've re rehearsed the right questions, whether they've done the right background on your company and industry. But getting beyond that to a conversation, getting them off script is actually where you're going to learn most of what really makes them tick and that'll help you a lot more when it gets down into culture. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about experience. Um, 
more historically speaking a lot of people think more experience is better it's important to bear in mind several things though first of all the relevance of that experience does it apply to your current company and situation um, also the duration versus variety was it better to have somebody who's been in the same job for a long period of time same industry and has learned it deeply or is it better to have variations where they did some marketing and then they did some sales and then they did some uh, operations and then they did some finance and and uh, so that's one thing to bear in mind, or there's a couple things to bear in mind when evaluating a candidate's experience. The other thing I like to point out is um, a lot of people think of, there is one school of thought that experience outside of your organization or function or industry can actually be a detriment because people have learned, and like I said, we're not always flexible, we're based on our experience, we're a product of our experience, and it, you don't know if that translates well to your industry. A lot of companies like to hire people who are deliberately inexperienced, they're sort of blank slates and they train them and that's uh, something you might want to bear in mind. Also, um, uh, as opposed to experience, one of the things you might want to bear in mind is uh, a person's nature. Sometimes someone is a natural born fit for a job and they're uh, e aggressive and you think they'd be a good cultural fit uh, but they don't have the right experience uh, versus someone who doesn't who has all of the checks all the right boxes on experience but doesn't seem like a good fit and that's a big debate as to which one of those is better I think uh, I used an example from somebody who gave a, a presentation on people in the nightclub business and you know it's a high energy business a it was a restaurant and bar business and he stated you know you can have somebody who walks across the room kind of slowly and you say to him hey pick it up we gotta keep going and they'll be active for the next hour day but you know a week later they're going to be back to their normal pace because that's just their pace and that's the kind of thing where uh you want to you want to look for their nature more than their experience or their training because that person you know it's better to have a high energy person who'd never worked in that environment because it's going to be such a natural fit for them um, another thing to bear in mind I'll, I'll be brief about this is just the culture sometimes people who are very experienced and very skilled um, still aren't still aren't a good you know the great on paper still aren't a good fit for your organization and some there's one school of thought that says uh, avoiding bad apples is more important than uh, having stars that's actually a really debatable point um, because stars can be uh, then the other school of thought is stars aren't just slightly better than you know not 10 percent better than average people stars are 10 times better something like that but um culture is one of the easy ways you can get bad apples and you have what i call the uh the invasive species phenomenon where someone comes from a more aggressive culture into a very cooperative culture and then they'll get results really quickly because they're so aggressive and then they'll get promoted and everybody else starts to adopt the same pattern of behavior and uh, oftentimes the short-term gains will uh, cause a long-term detriment to the culture and culture is always easier to destroy than it is to build. Here are some common selection uh, mistakes to avoid. I put some pluses up here, things to do, here are some negatives. Um, one is the grass is always greener phenomenon. If you have a group of people with certain skills and talents, you want to look outside to find someone who's better. Uh, it's easy to find someone who's better in some ways, but oftentimes you don't know their faults. So it's kind of the, uh, my father, that you could say the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. You're always looking to the outside. Historically speaking, the research shows that most internal candidates outperform external candidates, uh, especially the high price stars from, from outside. It's, it's a, the culture element is very difficult to translate. Um, and also there's a, another mistake that you can make is you select people who are like you because you were successful enough to be promoted and now you're in the making the selections. But it's important to remember sometimes people, there, there's more than one way to do things. People with a different style than you might be equally effective. And then the last one is, uh, I use several examples of some confusions you can make. Um, one of the common ones is the one I put on the board, uh, confusing likable with effective. We tend to hire people that we like the best, and it's important to remember that the most important criteria is the effectiveness of them. Likeability can be a commentary on culture, but not necessarily. Also, uh, some other ones I didn't put on the board. We tend to uh, confuse experience with qualifications and fit. We tend to confuse informed with intelligent. Someone who's done their homework for the interview will come off sounding like they know a lot about the industry or the company, but then you hire them the next day and you realize that was sort of all they knew. That was just their background research. They're not actually capable of uh, independent thought and making uh, decisions relevant that, that are in the best interest of the business. So with that in mind, let's move on to, those are some selecting criteria. Let's talk about a little bit about new managers and we can 
gear this speech towards new managers or more senior, depending on the audience. But um, some of the things that new managers need to consider, first of all, they uh, prioritize. Uh, you're probably going to be asked to do more than you possibly can. And you're also going to have everybody coming to you asking you to help them with resources. Everybody, it's going to be a sort of a fight for resources because everybody uh, thinks what they're working on is the most important. And so you might have to learn to prioritize. That's especially true in big organizations where IT wants you to do all the IT paperwork and HR wants you to do all the HR paperwork. And there's so much administration, you wouldn't get anything done if you did it all. And so learning to prioritize is important. I always say most times you got two jobs. Every job has two jobs. There's the job of what your boss tells you to do and uh, what the organization expects you to do. And then there's the job of what you think is important. And you really have to do them both effectively. Um, the next one to remember is, this is a common mistake for new managers. You've got to remember that power is informal, especially if you're new. You are untested as a manager. The fact that you are above people in the org chart doesn't mean you can just come in and fire and hire whoever you want. Oftentimes, the boss wants to see you uh, get some results, you want some quick wins before you get that informal authority and uh, likewise uh, sometimes the people beneath you are uh, better experts in your field than you are and so they have more informal authority than you do. They also might be the boss's golfing buddy or the boss might think a lot of them and so you have to manage them differently to someone who isn't as well established. Um, next thing I think you should bear in mind for new managers is you've got to remember that you're guiding now versus doing and it's easy to drop back into that doing it yourself kind of phenomena, which leads me to the first um, thing that you need to avoid, and that is you want to avoid cultivating dependency. Remember now, when you go, when you're a new manager and someone you think is off track and you end up getting deep in with them and doing it with them, their thought is, okay, the boss wants to be involved in this. So the next time they have something, they're going to bring it to you, and now you're out of priorities. Uh, you can't prioritize because you're doing everything uh, with them or for them. And so it's important to point out, if you're doing something and getting it back on track, you still want to get them, you, you still need them to understand that you're guiding them. You're not, that's not necessarily that you want them to bring every decision to you or every problem to you. Um, next thing to avoid is you want to be open-minded. A common mistake of new managers is they're going to say, I'm going to be different than all the bosses I've had. I'm going to be more open. I'm going to, you know, a lot of the, give everybody the discretion that they want. But what you'll oftentimes find in short order is there was a reason the bosses were that way. You just didn't understand it before you were a manager. So be open-minded. Don't automatically assume that you know how to be a manager and don't uh, institute a lot of things that uh, uh, you might end up regretting. Uh, next, if you want to move on to the more senior managers, now that we've learned to be uh, new managers will quickly be promoted. And, and I put this little chart on here where I talk about seniority and, and sort of the, the share of your wor work. Um, doing the work becomes as almost, you know, as your first job, even before you're a manager, that's almost all of what you do. Then as you go up, the, the work, doing the work declines, the decision making increases, and also the people management decreases. So by the time you're a CEO, you're doing almost uh, making decisions and managing people. And you could argue people is even, I, I put it here, is bigger than half because even though you're making decisions, it's oftentimes based on the recommendation of the people you've selected. Also, as you become more senior, you, the, you have more of a say in setting the culture and which one of these things is going to be uh, critical. And also, you, you focus less on the management and more on the leadership. And that's a, that's a bit of a, a common topic of discussion. A lot of, pe a lot of people sort of like to hear themselves say, well, I don't, we're not just managers, we're leaders. And uh, it's a bit uh, trite at times because it's ill-defined, but I always say, um, Lead, leadership, the difference between leading and managing. Managing is more about marshalling resources and leading is more about inspiring and, and giving the organization a sense of purpose. And it's also about cultivating loyalty among your subordinates and also about uh, at some point you, your people aren't just doing it because it's their job, they're doing it because they, they don't want to disappoint you and they feel uh, committed to the organizational purpose. So that's a little bit about uh, management tactics and tools. Let's talk a little bit about, since some, most of what we've talked about so far is managing the people uh, that you are uh, over, let's talk about some of the things that, you know, this is a two-way street here and we'll eventually make it even larger. Uh, it's, it's also what you can provide for your employees. You're going to be asked to marshal their resources, um, provide them with the tools they need. You're also going to have to provide them, quote, air cover from senior management and you're, uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit. 
and also you want to give them information and sometimes even if you can't give them what they want all the things that they want it's important that they just know why and they understand the constraints even if it doesn't change what they're going to do uh, a good analogy for this is in a traffic jam if you're going to be in a traffic jam for 30 minutes but you know it's going to be 30 minutes and you know what the problem is ahead because you can see it and you know how long it's going to take to clear it feels a lot better than if you're just sitting there even if you're going to be there for another 30 minutes but if you're sitting there without any knowledge it's terribly frustrating and that's kind of a motivational issue you want to make sure you share the information with the team so that they know why these things are happening even if there's nothing that can be done about it because it will it's uh soothing shall we say um, and also you know talking about air cover the next thing I, point i wanted to bring up is you know, management is not just about managing your subordinates. It's, uh, I call it three-dimensional management. You also have to manage up, which means you're going to be setting expectations for what's possible and putting boundaries on what the team can and can't do. And you're also going to be managing to the sides, which means you're going to be, you know, most, most organizations, most teams don't exist in a vacuum. You're, if you're in sales, you're working with marketing. And if you're in uh, engineering or finance, you're working with other people, left, right, front, back. Uh, and I call that managing in three dimensions. You have to have relationships with the other people in the organizations, the other groups in the organizations. And as a manager, it's important that you cultivate those so that your team can interact accordingly. So anyway, that is my presentation on the, my sample video on managing people. There's a few things that I couldn't fit on the board that I want to just give some quick lip service to. We didn't talk about evaluating people. I have some thoughts on uh, some of the tools you can use as well as the uh, one of my theories is oftentimes in organizations we overlook the return on investment. You know, we look at just whether they grew share or grew sales, but we didn't ask what investment they put into that. And then if you have an organization where people move around quickly, by the time the, uh, the ROI uh, could be evaluated, the people have moved and you can't tell who's responsible for what. Um, also talk a little bit about values versus results because there are sometimes you can get results but at the short-term expense of organizational culture. And we want to talk about how to manage that. Um, also, some of the tools that get used in large companies are oftentimes the classic evaluation form. And oftentimes those things get whitewashed. It becomes sort of everybody knows that uh, you give everybody a pass. And there's also the problem of sometimes people give the best uh, evaluations to the people who do the worst job because they're trying to get them promoted out of there. Uh, we didn't also talk about developing people. I have some tips on feedback. Um, some, some common mistakes about uh, determining what people need. Sometimes they, they just don't get it and they just need a little guidance and they can, they can sort it out even if they're underperforming. Likewise, sometimes you have bad fits. People are not performing and, and the theory is uh, that they're not good at something, but they might be good at something else. It might just be a bad fit. And finally, we didn't talk much about motivation. I can talk about the classical models of motivation, Hertzberg, two factors which is uh, talking about things that are necessary but not sufficient, like compensation. Um, I also like to talk a lot about the Progress Principle, which is a book published by a Harvard professor recently that says one of the things that people really want to do, what really motivates them, is when they see and perceive progress. And uh, then the la oh, we already talked about information there. So those are some things that we can include in the live presentation. I hope you found this beneficial. If you'd like to see something like this presented to your organization or at your event, please contact me at keithwhite.com. For a, for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.